Now, on behalf of the Seattle Seahawk ownership and the rest of the organization, I'm very pleased and excited today to announce that Dennis Erickson will become the next head football coach of the Seattle Seahawks. Coach Erickson is a man who has been extremely committed to coaching and to winning his entire life. He's won at every level that he's coached at, and we expect this trend and trait to continue with the Seattle Seahawks. Our goal is to win, to get better, to be successful. No timetable on a lot of things, but you know how competitive I am. Uh, we want to get in the playoffs as soon as we can. Eventually, we would like to get to the Super Bowl. I mean, all those are things that, that every franchise wants, and we're going to work like heck to get that done. With these words, native son Dennis Erickson left the University of Miami and returned home. Erickson, a native of Everett, Washington, won two national championships in his first three years at Miami. He adds to a bright future for a team that already has a proud past. is Ellard, Freeze looks right, fires, intercepted by Terry Wood, and he could be gone. The team that Dennis Erickson inherits is not in need of a major retooling job. In fact, the Seahawks are not far from becoming contenders, as was proven by their fast start in 1994. Seattle used more traditional blocking schemes to run over the Redskins on opening day. Relying on what would become the foundation of their attack, the Seahawks racked up nearly 200 yards rushing, and Chris Warren had the first of a team record seven 100-yard days. Two touchdowns by Warren, and a TD pass from Rick Meyer to Brian Blades wrapped up a 28-7 victory. Meyer had his first big day of the season the next week against the arch-rival Raiders when he completed 19 of 25 with three touchdown passes. Meyer, good protection, pump fake, fires the home run ball down there, got Bates, he's got it, touchdown Seahawks! With the running game taking a backseat to the passing game, Warren did not get to the century mark, but he brought his season touchdown total to four six-pointers in two games, scoring once on the ground and once through the air. Screens it to Warren at the 40, 35, 30, gets a block, 25, takes away 20, 15, 10, 5, touchdown. In a total team effort, the Seahawks defense did not allow a touchdown. The Seahawks were 2-0 after their laugher over the Raiders. Home, however, was not quite home sweet home. Due to construction problems at the Kingdome, the University of Washington graciously allowed the Seahawks to play several games at Husky Stadium. But following a loss to the AFC champion Chargers, Seattle came back strong and crushed AFC finalist Pittsburgh. Once again, the Seahawks offense was a beautiful blend of passing and running. Chris Warren picked up 126 yards on the ground and scored his fifth touchdown of the year. With a Meyer scoring toss to Trey Junkin, Seattle had 30 points and was averaging nearly 27 points a game. The defense was playing just as tough. Included in the defensive day's work was a goal line stand that featured four stops from inside the five yard line and a touchdown by rookie cornerback Orlando Waters. In their three and one start, the defense had allowed just four TDs. The following week, they had their game faces on again. Up. I'm getting around the corner and he's stepping up. What do you want to do there? He 
they should call a max spot, right. let you go, that and then me and Black will take the back. I'm in the zone. I'm in the zone. Unfortunately, the offense was not. The Seattle Seahawks are the youngest team in the NFL. And as sometimes happens, a narrow loss in a winnable game hurts for a long time. The two-point loss to the Colts had just such an effect for to a man from owner Ken Baring and President David Baring through every member of the team, the Seahawks felt they should have beaten Indianapolis. Ultimately, a combination of youthful mistakes, missed opportunities, and an injury epidemic that cost Seahawks players 213 games threatened to lay waste to the Seahawks' promising start. Seattle's early season sublime sink was sunk. The Seahawks gave up only one touchdown to the Broncos, but lost because they could score just seven points of their own. The next week, the Seahawks scored 23 points, including the first two-point conversion in team history, but gave up 38 to the Chiefs. Against the Chargers, nothing went right. The Seahawks did not allow a touchdown again against the Bengals, but lost by three points in overtime to a safety and six field goals. In week 11, Seattle lost by a touchdown or less for the fourth time during a six-game losing streak. But rather than being run out of town, this young team learned what it takes to win tight games and would prove it with a stretch run later in the year. The individual units that make up a good team are there in Seattle. Special teams have been a Seahawks strength throughout the team's existence. In 1994, all-pro punter Rick Tooten regularly drove return men inside the 20-yard line, where bomb squatters like special teams captain Tracy Johnson, Dean Wells, Michael Bates, and Terrence Warren made certain they stayed. Tooten had at least one kick inside the 20-yard line in every game but one, and set a team record with 33 punts inside the 20. When the Seahawks weren't pinning difficult field position on opponents, they were pinning opponents' return men, period. Traditionally, special teams are where young players earn their stripes, and the Seahawks had 12 eager rookies on the squad. But learning the intricate ballet-like footwork of the offensive line usually takes more time. In one case, however, a precocious rookie named Kevin Mawai was a quick enough study to make the all-rookie team at guard. Mawai, the team's number two draft choice, was an important cog in the strongest element of the team, the running game, as escorted by an excellent offensive line. Offensive captain center Ray Donaldson became just the ninth player in NFL history to start in 200 straight games. Right tackle Howard Ballard played in four Super Bowls as a bellwether with the Bills. Early in the year, Bill Hitchcock handled right guard and gave Mawai time to learn, teaming with Donaldson and Ballard to create room on the right flank. On the left side, Seahawks ball carriers were provided safe passage thanks to guard Jeff Blackshear, number 69, and tackle Ray Roberts, number 73. Mix in the blocking of tight ends Farrell Edmonds and Paul Green and fullbacks Tracy Johnson and Steve Smith, number 35. And the recipe bakes up into the second best rushing attack in the NFL, averaging over 130 yards a game. The most obvious beneficiary was running back Chris Warren, who led the AFC in rushing and set a team record with 1,545 yards. All of the Seattle fullbacks are versatile, either blocking or catching passes with equal aplomb. With Smith, Tracy Johnson number 43 or Max Strong number 38 at fullback, the Seahawks are one of only three teams to have improved their running game in each of the last three years. When second year quarterback Rick Meyer showed play action, defenses had to respect the play fake giving Meyer more time to find open receivers. The result was that Meyer threw just seven interceptions in 381 attempts to tie for the lowest interception rate in the league. 
He can play the classic drop back role or the nimble escape artist with an uncanny ability to complete passes while being on the lam. Meyer knows when to throw and when to run, for he's not just a great athlete turned quarterback always thinking run before pass. Rick Meyer is a quarterback through and through, with all the skills needed to excel in the NFL. He has enough arm to explore the middle of a zone, finding tight end Paul Green 30 times, and enough touch to drop a pass into the hands of Brian Blades, catching him dead in stride. Meyer doesn't panic, and why should he? He has in Brian Blades one of the best pass catchers in the league. In 1994, only two AFC wide receivers caught more passes than Blades. In 1994, Blades broke his own team record with 81 receptions and had the third 1,000-yard season of his career. He did it by playing the game the only way he knows how to play it, full out. Blades now ranks third in team history in receptions and touchdowns, and second in yards and 100-yard games. The player ahead of him was on hand to hand-deliver the 1994 Steve Largent Award, presented to the Seahawks player that best exemplifies the spirit, dedication, and integrity of the Seattle Seahawks. Brian Blades was not the only member of the Seahawk family to enjoy a banner year. Another was former Seahawk great Steve Largent, who was elected to both the U.S. Congress and the Pro Football Hall of Fame. That you will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office upon which you are about to enter, so help you God. You are a member of the 103rd Congress. Blades, you're in a privilege to tell you officially uh, that you have been selected to the Pro Football Hall of Fame. This is your first year of eligibility, and obviously, uh, Steve, uh, all the people who are here and all the football world uh, congratulate you at this moment. It goes without saying that this is a tremendous honor, and I, I my head's spinning right now, and, and thank you, and, uh, you know, I, I have, uh, I'm, I'm so thankful uh, for the opportunity that I had to play and participate in the National Football League. One of the things that I always strive to be is uh, the consummate team player and recognize that uh, the, the whole is much bigger than the sum of its parts. And, and uh, so this, this honor definitely is an honor uh, that I share with all those people that have contributed to my life and to my football career. Steve Largent, one of the most popular players ever to wear a Seahawks uniform, was the first player ever inducted into the Ring of Honor, a tribute that in 1994 was accorded to running back Kurt Warner, who became the fifth man to be so honored. A first round draft choice from Penn State, Warner played for Seattle for seven seasons. When he left the Seahawks, he held virtually every team rushing record in the books. But far better than by numbers, he will be remembered for the excitement everyone in the kingdom felt whenever he touched the ball. The same excitement they felt when Kurt Warner had his name entered into the Seattle Seahawks Ring of Honor. Thank you very much for such a warm reception. I'll tell you, this place brings back a lot of good memories for me. A lot of good memories. I'll tell you, it's, it's good to be back, and I'm just very thankful to have uh, so many people involved because uh, 
the things that I've accomplished, I can't take full credit for. It. I had a wonderful supporting cast, a lot of great football players that I had an opportunity to play with, and I'd like to share this, this honor with them. I'd like to also thank the Seahawk organization for inviting me to be a part of the Ring of Honor. I consider it to be a, a privilege and an honor, and I am deeply humbled. I'll tell you, I don't think there's a better place to play in, in the world than in this kingdom. And I want to thank you for that. And lastly, I'd just like to say thank you again, and God bless all of you. Thank you. Another element of the Seahawks' proud past is Vice President of Football Operations Chuck Allen, who is retiring after being with the Seahawks during all of their 20-year existence. Allen saw the growth of the Seahawks organization from its infancy and has been part of the American Football Conference since the days when it was known as the AFL. As a rookie in 1961, number 50 was named to the All-AFL team. Chuck Allen will be missed. The Seahawks defensive line combines the youth of number one draft pick Sam Adams with the experience of Joe Nash, still a force after 13 seasons of seasoning in Seattle. Sam Adams from Texas A&M showed why he was the eighth player selected in the college draft. But the key players on any unit are young veterans who combine enthusiasm and experience to reach the top of their game. Such a player is Cortez Kennedy, who in his fifth year has become a perennial All-Pro. Reunited with his old college coach, there's no telling how good he can be. Kennedy is capable of dismantling an offense all by himself, leaving the pieces for other defensive linemen like Brent Williams, number 93. Williams, a nine-year veteran, Michael Sinclair, number 70, just in his fourth season, and Antonio Edwards, number 67, a second-year pro, give the Seahawks a perfect blend of want-to and know-how at the defensive end position. Young veterans abounded at linebacker, where Rod Stevens, number 94, completed his sixth season, and Bob Spitalski, number 58, finished his third. Rufus Porter, number 97, played seven seasons for Seattle since making it as a free agent. Porter, one of the most respected outside pass rushers in the league, could make plays on either end of the line. But no one covers more ground than number 90, Terry Wooden. In 1994, Terry Wooden averaged almost one play a game on which he trapped an opponent for a loss. fifth year in the NFL was his finest as he had four straight games with at least 12 tackles was one tackle away from leading the team in that category and tied for team leadership and in interceptions the Seattle linebacking core helped the secondary defense the pass and was a big part of shutting down the run in turn they were supported by the secondary Number 21, Raphael Robinson, could stop a runner with a perfect form tackle, 
or pick a receiver's pocket. Robinson, a third-year safety, and Carlton Gray, number 26, who completed just his second season, should give the Seahawks many years of solid play in the secondary. Robert Blackman, number 25, a second-round draft choice in 1990, finished his fourth season as a starter and is another young veteran who is reaching his full power as a player. Two players provided heavy doses of experience in the secondary. After nine years in the NFL, Patrick Hunter, number 27, had enough savvy not to be sorry. The leader in the secondary is safety Eugene Robinson, number 41. Man, we gotta keep talking. That's what we're eliminating lots of. We just keep talking, we're eliminating a lot of jokes. Robinson is virtually a coach on the field. The Seahawks defensive captain who played in 120 consecutive games continues to make big plays in many of them. The Seattle defense is another unit with the right mix of fresh faces, old hands, and players at their peak. With five weeks left in the season, every segment of the Seahawks was primed to get back into the race. With victories in their final five games, the Seahawks could still finish the season with a winning record. But with less than three and a half minutes left, Seattle trailed by six and was 77 yards away from the go-ahead score. Pitches to Strong around the right side of the 10. Strong to the 5. Touchdown, Max Strong! 42 seconds left to go in the game, and the Seahawks have made their comeback. The Seahawks faced another gut check the following week against the Chiefs. In a defensive struggle, two Kansas City field goals gave the Chiefs the lead before Meyer stood strong in the face of a fearsome pass rush and rallied Seattle with another fourth quarter drive. Smith and Johnson, the setbacks, give to Smith, touchdown, Seahawks, Steve Smith. And a big hole to good clock up front by his offensive line. When the Chiefs reclaimed the lead with a third field goal, the Seahawks came back yet again. This will be from the right hash mark, a 32-yarder for John Casey. Come on, man! Do that right! Do that right, man! Snap is back, place down, kick on the way, and it is good! Leading once more, one more big play was needed and provided by the Seattle defense. On, defense! Come on, D, turn over, turn over! Left end of play, Bono looking left, flares it out, got it to Dawson, lost the football, it's loose, the Seahawks are going to pick it up! Roger Blackman to the 20, to the 15, and pushed out of bounds! That'll do it. Now you can celebrate this one. That was as gutsy a win as I've ever seen. A gutsy, gutsy win. You guys are marvelous. I'm proud of you. Enjoy yourself. You deserve it. You deserve it. Two straight come from behind victories lost all value the next week when an accident drastically changed the life of teammate Mike Fryer. The despair everyone in Seattle felt for Mike made it virtually impossible to prepare for a football game, and the Seahawks lost to the Colts. The following week in Houston, Rick Meyer, injured in the Colt game, was missing, so Seattle turned to the one man who could carry them. It's to Warren around the left side, cuts back at the 35, to the 30, breaks a tackle, 20, 15, 10. Chris Warren is flipped up and knocked out of bounds, or was he? Touchdown. Chris Warren turned in the best rushing performance in the AFC in 1994 by totaling 185 yards. 
The team had a league-best 266 yards rushing as the Seahawks beat the Oilers and earned their sixth and final win of the season. Chris Warren had plenty of reason to smile in 1994. The fifth-year running back played in the Pro Bowl, led the conference in rushing, and became just the 28th player ever to compile three straight 1,000-yard seasons. McGuire gives to Warren, got a hole, 30, 25. Warren cuts it outside. 20, 15, 10, 5, touchdown, Chris Warren. Warren goes 33 yards as he cut it back from right to left, and they weren't going to get it. But Chris Warren does it again. He is the guy on this offense. There's no question about it. Put the weight of the team on his shoulders, and he's going to carry him. And he has carried it in every way possible. This play made him the first Seahawks player ever to have a reception, run from scrimmage, punt, and kickoff return of over 50 yards. In addition to his team record, 1,545 yards rushing, Warren added over 300 yards on receptions to lead the AFC in total yards and break Kurt Warner's team record. In 1994, Chris Warren finished second to Barry Sanders in average per carry and 100-yard performances. And he shares another important attribute with the Lions' great runner. He simply refuses to go down without a fight. Chris Warren was named the team's most valuable player in 1994. But he and every Seahawk realizes that while individual accomplishments are nice, they are the result of the efforts of every player on the team and are achieved because of a common goal, winning. We do have to worry about winning and we, we have to do the right things in the off season and, and uh, uh, on the field to win and I expect that from them. In turn, they expect me to, to give them the best opportunity to win, and that's what it's all about. And uh, we're going to do the best job we can coaching to give them the opportunity to win, and we expect the same thing from them as far as effort and what they need to do in order for us to, to get in the playoffs next year.